Um, this is Carl Worth, everybody, and he's going to be talking about From Click to Pixel, a tool the Linux graphic stack. Thank you. <laughs> OK, so as Kristen mentioned, my name is Carl Worth. I work for in Intel. Um, I get to, to sit with uh, Keith Packard, and, uh, and that's, that's a, a great pleasure. I enjoy that. So um, I, I will be I, some of. So let me let me launch right into it and say because it'll talk about what I'm going to talk about. What I'm uh, going to talk to, about today is the the Linux graphics stack. I want to help anyone uh, understand uh, what it is and kind of how it works and what's going on. And more than that, I'm hoping to be able to give you some tools for how you can uh, examine what's going on more efficiently. And uh, my desire in teaching you, is, of course, is born of pure laziness. Because if I teach you how to investigate what's going on, then you can figure things out yourself without having to ask me questions. I don't like to ever be in a position where I know something that no one else does, because then people want to have me I don't know, use that knowledge and, and work. So instead, I'm going to share this knowledge so that you guys can do some work. That's my goal. So um, uh, the middle part of the talk is going to be yeah, how to, how to investigate layer by layer what's going on in the graphic stack. And at the end, well, one of the reasons the graphic stack is hard to understand because it's, it's, it's never static. It's always changing. So we're going to talk about some of what's, what's changing and, and what the future might hold. So first of all, um, if you just attended Keith's talk, you heard him talk about a lot of different things. And they all have these weird little acronyms and names. There's DRI, there's AIGLX, there's Gallium Render. And it's all, it's all very confusing. And a lot of people get really confused. How, the, how do these different pieces fit together and what's going on? So hopefully we can cut through some of that mess and explain some of the things. So I'm going to start by just giving a real quick overview of what the, the graphic stack looks like. And I'm going to do this in, in 2D and 3D. And it's really quite simple. There's not a lot of pieces. So here's, and I, I will preface this by saying this is my perception of the graphic stack. Some other people might have drawn different things. So you have my personal biases and my corporate biases fully uh, codified there. And if you have a problem with that, go listen to someone else's talk. But you came to mine today, so you're stuck. Um, so here's the 2D graphic stack. You've got applications. They want to draw things. And many of them use the, the Cairo graphics library to do that. Others will use other things. Qt has something that works very much like uh, Cairo. So you could put, it's called R3. You could put that in, in its place. Um, there are applications that don't really use any of this, this, much of this graphic stack. They draw everything in software, but that's not very, very interesting. Um, most applications in, in Linux that actually want to want to draw something uh, will draw it to the X server, and Cairo will talk uh, render protocol to to the X server. Then inside the X server, we have various different uh, hardware-specific drivers. And we have this acceleration interface, like Keith talked about, UXA now replacing EXA. And um, so then that driver is going to talk, if you've got a gem-enabled uh, kernel and a gem-enabled driver like, like Keith described with the, the Intel stack, you, um, you'll talk there to, with the DRM and then finally execute things on the GPU. So we have those, those four pieces. We've got the application, the X server, then the kernel component for the memory management, et cetera, and finally executing things on the GPU. Clear enough? All right. 3D graphics stack. It's actually simpler. There's one fewer piece. We have an application. It's using an interface called OpenGL, and our implementation of OpenGL is Mesa. Then inside Mesa, there's hardware-specific drivers that talk to the kernel. The X server doesn't appear at all. Now, when you're running an OpenGL application like GLX Gears that Keith just ran, it actually is doing some talking with the X server, but the X server isn't involved in the rendering at all. So the stacks I'm showing here is what components are actually used in figuring out what the graphics are and getting them on the screen. The, the parts that OpenGL talks about is with the X server is like figuring out exactly where in, where memory needs to stuff things and clip lists and stuff like that. It's not really interesting for actually drawing stuff. So the 3D graphics stack has a nice advantage that is simpler. We've just got the application, OpenGL, the driver, the kernel, and the GPU. Uh, so let's now talk, look at the things layer by layer and try to figure out what, 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 what we can find out about what's going on. So imagine you have some 
graphics performance problem. And you're thinking, okay, there's this stack, and Carl said there's only four pieces, so the, there's, something's really slow and it shouldn't be. So it's gotta be in one of those four pieces, but which is it and where? Uh, obviously, the first thing you wanna do is, is profile your application. You can use O-Profile, you can use SysProf. Some people have religious feelings strongly for one versus the other. Whatever, I don't care. Just use those, use those first, and uh, try to figure out what's going on. And that's, that's f fairly obvious, but it, it deserves some repeat mention. I'm not gonna go into details about how to profile applications. I, I will say one thing, and we'll touch on this again later. Um, profiling can be tricky because these profilers uh, focus on where time is spent on the CPU. And w once you get into, um, deeply into the graphics stack and, and the graphics stack is working well, you actually want to be spending a lot of time on the GPU. So if things are actually running well, the CPU will be idle and the profiler doesn't actually tell you a lot about. Okay, if, so if the CPU is idle and all the work's going on the GPU, at that point you need some other kinds of tools to try to figure out, uh, then the profilers don't help you. But, but in that case too, if everything's running on the GPU, usually things are working well and people aren't complaining. Okay, so let's go through the, the 2D stack. We have application, Cairo, X server, and, um, and, and the kernel. And let's talk about some of the, the tools available to you to kind of find out what's going on. One of them, and some of these you'll notice, some of them um, are very convenient to use. They, they're dynamic, you don't have to recompile your application. Some of them are really painful. You have to recompile some component of the stack. You have to maybe edit a source file. Some of these are really hard and nasty to get at. And uh, some of these aren't really documented at all. It's just some, some experts in the field. And so what, some of what I'm trying to do is get some of this information out there and definitely we, we, want, we could use some better tools. It'd be kind of nice if you could just say, tell me everything in one simple way and, and get all the information. But here's one example of something you can do if you happen to be, if your application is using GTK, which a lot are, is if you recompile GTK with the enable debug configure option, and then when you run your application, you set the GTK debug environment variable to updates, it will actually draw these little red boxes everywhere, every time it updates something. So this is kind of interesting. Let me, let me give you an example of what this looks like. And I'm, I'm missing meetings too, look at that. Okay, so I've, ex, I've exported this LD library path, so I'm using my custom GTK, uh, my custom build of GTK with the debugging option. And I'm going to set that environment variable, and I'm going to run in a little application. So you saw that little, little couple little flashes of red, that's things getting redrawn. If I type a little bit, you can see more little flashes of red. So this, there's, every time I type a single character, I've got a row being updated. It's redrawing that whole row of text, and it's also drawing down here at the bottom the line numbers, line one, column 22, 23, 24. Now if, I, now if we watch again, let me open a new, a new tab here. Redraws everything, redraws the menus and things. This time, take a watch closely here where it says unsaved document, here where it says undo. On the first character, those flashed a little bit. And if you look closely at them, oh yes, undo was grayed out before, now it's no longer, and unsaved document picked up an asterisk. So this application is behaving well. It's only redrawing the things you expect it to. Um, as you hover over these things, if you look, it's kind of funny. The, these, so these icons are getting little highlights drawn around them, and, and you can see, Mostly here, GTK is behaving well. It's doing what you'd expect. Um, often, if you're, uh, depending on the way the GT particular GTK theme is written, it can do, um, there, there, there have often been bugs where you, you hover the, the mouse over the toolbar and you see the whole application repaint or something. And obviously, that's wrong. Um, this, this, will, this, this GTK uh, debug really will tell you about G bugs in GTK itself. It's still possible for the application to be drawing a lot more than it needs to be, and this tool won't actually see it. GTK could say, oh yeah, you need to uh, update a small, let's see if I get another window here, and I drag it across. So as I drag this window over that one, you can see, oh, this is gonna be very exciting. What just happened? Okay, you can see these small exposed rectangles being handed to the application and it's only, it only needs to redraw that portion. And that's the information GTK, the, uh, the X server and GTK are telling the application. The application could be stupid and redrawing everything and you wouldn't actually see that here. But um, you could if you went to a next level of stack. So this, the n next level, down at the Cairo level, this is a, um, a, a very new tool called Cairo Trace. This was just, uh, it's only been added as of Cairo versions 1.9, which is not 
Um, this is not released yet. We're hoping to push out a 1.9 snapshot this, this week. So today, if you want to get at this, you have to get a, a Git check out of Cairo. But once you make it and install it, it installs a binary for you and does everything so that you can just say Cairo trace my program. And when you do that, it, it captures an extremely reliable trace of every uh, graphics operation that was drawn through Cairo. So the advantage, the reason we did this is we kept getting a lot of people um, coming to us and saying, oh, my application's performing much slower than I expect it to be. It's not performing well. And we, we would always say, okay, well, let's, let's see some code. Show us what you're doing. And they say, oh, well, we have this 300,000 line proprietary program. Uh, or even if it was a free software program, it was huge and big. It's like Firefox or something. And um, we didn't want, we didn't want to just look at that. We wanted to see what was actually being drawn. So this was a great way for people to be able to feed to the Cairo community um, performance test cases without having to expose their proprietary application or without having to give us huge piles of code that can uh, just capture a, a quick trace of anything. So a quick example of how this works. I've written a small program here. Um, Cairotext.c. It's a is that showing up right? Yeah. So it's, um, all it does is it first paints the background, it sets the color to white, it paints the whole window, and then it chooses a font to draw, and chooses black, and draws a couple of words, like you might expect. So if we run this program, it, it, there, that's what it does. It's not very exciting. Um, but if we, so now let's do a color trace on that program and see what it, see what it, I used to do this. Okay. So I ran Cairo Trace. I run the program, and it tells me that it put its trace data in this particular file. Let's look at that. That's some print message in Cairo Trace that doesn't need to be there. All right. So here's the, here's the output from Cairo Trace. It does a couple of things. It has it's actually a sort of a variant of PostScript. The details aren't, aren't really necess necessarily interesting. Some of the things that you can see, though, um, in, in these comments, it gives you function calls. So where the, so xlib draw and draw are actual function calls in my program. So, it, so there I have some reference points into the trace file or things that I recognize as the author of the application. Okay, here's where I did that. And it says, and then the comment, so it says we have the calling function, the called function in Cairo, and then we have the actual trace data, which allows replay. So that you can take this script, and there's a separate tool that uh, will replay it, play it, so that uh, we can do, so you can hand it to someone who who could do the profiling or figure out whatever the bug is. And it looks pretty much like we'd expect it to do it. It uses a, it sets a white color, it paints the background, it sets the black color, and it shows hello world. So. Uh, pretty obvious kind of program to have. We, we didn't have it for several years, and it's going to be very helpful now that we do. The next level down. Um, oh, no, I, I wanted to say one other thing about that. Keith and I have a really lousy habit of doing just-in-time slide generation. So on our flight from, we, got, we did better this year than I think we've ever done. We usually spend about half of LCA writing uh, our talk. And not only writing the talk, we always have to write the, the program that renders the talk. Somehow we, we're always doing that. And um, I don't know, somehow we ended up get, getting the first and second slots this year. So we couldn't spend half of LCA writing a slide tool. We actually had to do it before we came. That was hard. So we did it on the plane on the way to LCA this year. <laughs> And as we did it, Keith had this lovely slide background. It had the little X coming up over the horizon and a little blue sky with a subtle gradient that probably didn't show up on the projector at all. But he had spent a lot of time doing it just right. And um, that blue sky wasn't filling, when he, when he went to, to full screen, the blue sky wasn't filling up the whole background. It was only drawing a portion of the screen. It was, it was, there was just a bug. Something was wrong. And so we got out Cairo Trace, and um, the bug could have been in the slide uh, the tool we wrote to display the slides, it could have been in Cairo itself, it wasn't very obvious, but uh, I, we ran Cairo Trace, just glanced immediately, and it was plain to see, yes indeed, it was saying draw a blue rectangle that's only half the size of the screen, and the application was. So it was an application bug, we knew exactly where to look, and we had it fixed in just a few minutes, uh, where it would have been, you know, a lot harder to do that. Okay, so at the next level down, we can actually capture, since uh, talking to the X server is um, a network protocol, we can capture that. Uh, and there, 
you know, you can use low-level tools like Wireshark to, to just capture traces, and they actually, Wireshark does have some information on interpreting X protocol, so it can actually display um, interpreted X packets. It doesn't always know um, all of the X extensions and things, and plus it's a, I don't know, it brings up a whole GUI and things. So a tool I prefer to use is Xtrace. It, it seems to understand more protocol. There's several different protocol tracers out there. So there's one called Xscope, and uh, there's several others, but many of them don't understand a lot of the, proto uh, pr the protocol extensions. Xtrace seems to understand a lot, and um, so let me display, let me give you an example of how to use this. And here's another one, as I was rehearsing this on the, um, on the plane, I ran this. I thought, oh, this will be a nice example. I'll just use that same Cairo text. So I'm going to run Xtrace on display number five and read the director. This is hard to type one-handed. Cairo text dot Xtrace. Sorry about this. It's kind of slow here. Let that go in the background. And now I'll just run my application. So now Xtrace is running, and it's, a, it's just a little proxy server. It's waiting for a connection. So I set my display to the same thing that I set that to, to column 5, and I run my Cairo text. And the um, Xtrace announced that it got a connection. Now I'm going to force an expose event here and come back sometime. There we go. And accept my application. Now let's look at the trace file. What, what we got? And particularly, since all I did, we're going to see a whole bunch of stuff. It's querying the X server about all these extensions and all this stuff that's really totally boring and uninteresting. What I care about is drawing those glyphs. So let's look for the word glyph. Okay, we have, um, this font's a little big. Okay, the first thing it does is it creates a glyph set, which is something inside the X server where it's going to hold on to uh, a cache of these glyphs. And then we, one by one, add all the glyphs that we plan to draw. So H E L O comma W. We already did O, so R. We already did L, so D. Whew. So that gives it. So we one by one at it. We've rasterized these glyphs on the client side. We've sent little images over to there. Now the server's going to hold on to those, and we have a little ID to refer to those little glyphs. And that's what we send in this this next file: X render composite glyphs, and uh, then the server draws them. Well, th then I generated an expose map. We're going to redraw everything. Well, we just sent all these images to the server and told it to cache them. So we, sh we shouldn't expect to see render add glyphs again. Just as instead, just see a single call to render composite glyphs. But instead, it creates a new glyph set. It sends the, uh, and it sends all the images again. Basically, we have no glyph caching here on this tiny little simple application. And this was surprising to me. I thought, oh, this is going to be a great example. I could show how we get great glyph caching in Cairo. And, Oh, there's no glyph caching at all. That's bad. So, um, what's going on? So it turns out, uh, let's look back at my program. I did that at the beginning here. This, um, this call here where we chose the font, Cairo Select Font Face, is, um, it turns out this is, an app, this is a, a call that no real application should, should ever make. We call this in Cairo the, the Toy Font API. And it's only, the only reason it exists is so that I can write 10 line demos and, and display them on a single slide. And because of that, it doesn't always do everything exactly that it should. So internally, that function is not, um, is, is d defeating any caching that Cairo would try to do. So I, I found a way to fix this program. I could, I could and what I did here is made a, um, I called it, instead of calling Cairo select font face, I called Cairo set font face. And the details of that I won't go into, but basically you can see we have a static uh, font face object that we hold on to. And because of that, we'll now actually get caching. So if I run this version, the restart Xtrace exits after it runs once. And I run my cached version. I force an expose event. Exit. And now if we look for glyphs, we should see that indeed we create a glyph set, we add the glyphs, and then the second time around, 
we just composite again. We didn't, phew, that's how, that's how it should work. We got nice caching. Now, so that would have been really bad if, if, if I'm like, okay, if I can write a 10-line program and find out that there's no glyph caching, it, it would be bad if everyone's desktop were doing that and if I had to come today and d announce that that's what everyone was getting was no glyph caching. But it turns out no real applications use that call. Real applications will look something much more like this. Um, they will use an, uh, another library called Pingo and here I have a, I'm, I'm doing basically the exact same program, but I'm just using Pango instead. So Pango internally, we use a different API inside Cairo that's the one that has all the, that gets all the real attention and it performs well. And so if I run this program, it displays the same thing. And if I did the trace, you'd see that it's actually doing caching. And so disaster averted, I didn't have to come and announce that my library is horrible. Okay, back to the slides. Um, so now, now we verified that GDK isn't redrawing things more than it should. We verified that we're getting caching in Sakaira the way we want. Uh, now things are being sent to the X server uh, efficiently. Inside the X server, what's happening? Well, we have this acceleration. Um, in the X server, we got EXA or, or UXA. Hopefully, it's able to accelerate things and call um, uh, functions in the driver that will implement on them on the GPU. Sometimes the driver will say, oh, I don't support that operation. You, you're going to have to fall back. And in that case, EXA will fall back to, to doing software rendering. And if it's EXA, that fallback's going to be very expensive. It might have to migrate uh, surfaces out of the GPU into CPU and then do the rendering there and then migrate them back. It's really slow. These fallbacks can be deadly. That migration cost is ameliorated dramatically with UXA, but it's still useful to know if you have um, fallbacks going on. Turns out in the X server, there is a mechanism for looking into the fallbacks. It's not dynamic. You have to go into X server exa, exa priv.h and change a hash define and recompile. And once you do that, you get more, your log files fill up with lots of fallbacks happening. Well, hopefully not. Hopefully we're accelerating everything. Um, one level slightly lower in the driver itself, at least in, in, in our driver, we used to have a very similar thing. We, people, when we wanted to explore fallbacks, we'd go and recompile it with some debug option. I finally decided this is silly to have to keep recompiling it to turn it on. And we want our users to be able to do that themselves. So we made a dynamic option where you, in your zorg.com file, you can turn on the fallback debug option and you get the, the similar kinds of fallback data in the log file. And I'm not going to go into an example of that. It's pretty obvious. OK, 3D state. So that was sort of the 2D stack. On the 3D side, um, if your application's not performing well in 3D, here's sort of a very simple flow chart of what, what you might look to. First thing you want to know is if the CPU is, is pegged. Are we, are we using 100% of the CPU? Is that what's, why it's ca causing it to go slow? So you want to start with a profiler, just like I said at the beginning of the talk. And if it is, and if it's, for, for example, spending all of its time in SW RAST, that's software rasterization, that's, that says, OK, we're doing a lot of fallbacks. Next question is, where are those coming from? And I'll get to that later. If the CPU is not pegged, if the CPU is actually idle, then something's going, wrong, going strange here. We, we've got a, a, an application that should be hitting the GPU. Um, we, we, we want things to be on the GPU, but instead, uh, and it is, the CPU is not busy, but it's still going glacially slow. So what's going, going wrong? Well, one thing that often happens is we might um, submit uh, a batch buffer to the GPU it's executing. And if some of the, the data referenced by that batch buffer, if we start writing to it after the hardware has already started executing from it, that's a very bad thing to do. Uh, and that's going to perform extremely slowly. Um, Eric Anholt has, uh, has a, did a, a quick hack once that would sort of automatically detect that case and tell you about it. We don't have that yet in, in a, uh, a nice clean option that you can just turn on and find out. But that's something we should probably do because anytime that happens, it should raise red flags and say, this is going wrong. Another thing that can go wrong is the chip can actually hang and nothing goes on. And if you have a, uh, that, if that's happening, uh, a very common cause is when we're, re we're emitting these several batch buffers, one thing that will happen is we'll put a batch buffer, and the very beginning of that batch buffer, we'll set up a whole bunch of state, and then we'll uh, continue with a bunch of operations that rely on that state. Well, then something will happen that will cause that batch buffer to be flushed, and we'll go on with the next batch buffer, and sometimes we forget to re-emit all the startup state. And when we do that, the GPU gets very unhappy with us and expresses its displeasure by hanging, always never tells us anything. It just stops working. So one of the things we can do 
there's this Intel debug environment variable, and there's I've, I've listed three different options it can take. Of course, obviously this is this is Intel specific. Um, maybe other drivers have have similar features, and maybe a good thing to do would be to find some common way to expose some of this stuff rather than having a driver specific debug options. But this is what I know about. Um, so some of the things you can set that to is fall, which will give you, uh, show all the software fallbacks in the log file. You can say batch, and every time we submit a batch buffer, it will actually decode it and dump the whole thing. You can also say sync, which is after submitting each ba batch buffer, wait until the GPU has gone completely idle before continuing on again. And that's really useful to, for identifying exactly which batch buffer it was that, the, that caused uh, this GPU to hang. So if you're submitting them as fast as you can, it's, it's not obvious to tell what's going on. So when you have the chip hanging, if you turn on Intel debug of batch and sync, you can often find out the problematic thing and, and then send, send angry messages with that trace to the, the driver author, and we'll, hopefully Eric will fix it really fast. Okay, uh, and there's other various little fiddly things if you look in the source. This, this Intel debug option is not documented anywhere that, other than this slide right now, as far as I know. Okay, finally, um, Keith talks a lot about the memory management we have inside the kernel uh, with Gem. We do expose some of its details in uh, via prop, and I'm going to go ahead and look at a couple of these. We've got uh, prop DRI, Gem objects, and Gem interrupt. That's the wrong place. So let me look at, let me show you just what those look like. Again, not a lot of, so Gem objects. Um, it's sort of typical kind of prop stuff, not a lot, not very verbose, doesn't tell you a lot of things, um, a lot of details about what you're seeing. But this number here is the number of uh, object bytes. The number of, so we have 1,381 uh, gem objects comprising that many bytes. Meanwhile, eight of those objects are pinned, they, they can't be paged out. And that's comprising a large number of those, those bytes. So most of, the, uh, most of the bytes, so we have, here's our total aperture space. Here's how much of it's being used, and most of that's actually being pinned. We don't have a lot of detail. Does, what's that? This is, yeah, this is probably DRI1. Okay, yeah. So that's, that's why I have a large amount of pinned stuff. This is the old world. Yeah. Yeah, so this, as, as things get paged out, if I, like Keith just was loading Virtual Forbidden City, and this, this number was growing huge and huge and huge, while this one stayed pegged at just slightly less than the total. He'd mapped everything he could, and yet the application still wanted more. There are very hungry 3D applications out there. Another one. Yes. Yes, exactly. The giant pinned is DRI1. That's, that's the problem that went away with what Keith talked about before. Uh, uh, another thing you, that's very useful, uh, if you have, sorry, having interrupt uh, problems, you can actually look here and find various details about um, how many interrupts have been received, the current, um, the last sequence counter that, that was submitted with the batch buffer, which one we're waiting on. And so if, if you see a non-zero value here, that's something waiting on an interrupt that never got delivered or never got received for some reason. So there's, there's a couple of details there. Okay. Um, that's my overview of the stack and how to inspect it. I'm going to ask for questions at the end, but if you have any questions about that, hold on to them. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about where things can go from here. So earlier I showed the 2D stack and the 3D stack. Here they are in one slide. Um, we've got both things talking to the same kernel. Obviously there's one GPU. Obviously we've got, well not obviously, but we do now have a single memory manager in the kernel that are used by both the 2D and the 3D stack. One of the problems we have is that we have a driver interface inside the X server and we have a driver interface inside uh, Mesa. So that means every time a new 